Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex, and this is Things I Wish I Learned Earlier About Containers, uh, Lessons Learned from a, from a Seasoned Linux Admin. Uh, I add Seasoned Linux Admin because I realize I've been doing technology in some form or fashion for 24 years, which seems weird to say. I got an early start. Um, and so this kind of came about because uh, it's one of the things that kind of passed me by, and we'll get into that. But first, um, I want to say thank you for being here. Um, this is my first talk in person since 2019. Um, a lot of things happened since then. So it's good to be back. It's good to be up on the stage, in a community, out and about. Um, and there's a lot of conversations going on right now. There's a lot of presentations going on right now. It's right before lunch. There's a lot of places you could have been. So I just want to say thank you genuinely uh, for coming to my talk, finding it interesting enough to spend your time with me today. So why this topic? Um, I would like to give some context whenever I decide to write about something or speak about something um, to give some kind of background context. And so this one in particular is interesting. Um, in 2020, much like many people, even to this day, got laid off. And after 13 years at one job and kind of progressing in one general role, um, I found myself looking at the job market again. Um, I spent my time for those 13 years in a, uh, what we call bare metal now, right? But then it was called dedicated, right? A hosting environment where we did a lot of um, multi-tenant, 10, 30 plus server environments, kind of on average. And then some customers had hundreds of servers, but they were all physical servers. This is even before virtualization was became a, became a big thing. And so I spent a good portion of my time there working on physical servers training, mentoring, uh, we're looking for, uh, onboarding people in that kind of realm. And I knew that containers, what we're talking about now, it was around, it was there, but just wasn't in our realm. Uh, we had a lot of enterprise level customers who, as some of you may know, are just slow to move. So they weren't gonna be adopting things like containers and VMs too soon. So it's one of those things that I didn't get a chance to really dig into. So fast forward to 2020, get laid off, I'm looking at the job market again. And I had this gut, just gut impact where I was like, I missed something, right? Because all the postings, all the jobs were containers, Kubernetes, um, virtualization, all those kind of other things that I didn't have a lot of experience with. So um, I consider myself to be a, a lifelong learner. I like to learn things. The thing about technology, right, is that there's always something new to learn. There's always opportunities to learn, always something new. Um, and if you feel like it's too much or you feel like it's always something new and kind of the, the downside, I always said it's maybe not the best environment for you, right? So that's primarily this topic here because I found myself in a space where I had to learn something. Um, I, I usually I learn things, got a deadline or I have a job, right? Like in this case here, I have a project. And so it finally came time to really bang my head against this and kind of try and learn. So, so who's this for, right? So, I wrote this for myself, who, who I was about two years ago, right? I need to learn something. Then I, these are things I wish someone had pointed out to me. But I also wrote this for boop, uh, the container converts, right? The people who are here and like, I know I need to learn this. I'm not, I haven't really got into it yet, but I know I need to learn it, so I want to start learning it. And maybe I can guide you on that path and kind of like highlight that path a little better. Um, I also wrote this for the container curious. Um, those who, uh, like me through most of that career, at 13 year span, I knew it was there, I knew it was coming, but it wasn't my day to day work and it wasn't in the space where I, I needed to learn it essentially. So, but I was always curious, right? And at the time, I think around 2012, I think when uh, Docker was becoming more prominent, most of the tutorials were how to run bash in a container. In my environment, I didn't, matter much, there was no point to that. I didn't see a use for it, right? And kind of my blind sight on that. And then I wrote this for the container curmudgeons. Um, <laughs> me, probably 2016 to 2018, 2019, where I just didn't want to learn it. I had enough on my plate. I didn't want to. Um, and I, I, I say this one as well because during the job search, I interviewed with a company who I'd worked with many other people beforehand. And they called me up and they said, hey, you know, we know you're learning these things. We know you were on this kind of path. 
We don't know any of that. But our environment is, again, bare metal servers, lots of them. Um, I think they had like 100 plus servers in, in their environment they were managing. Like we know we need to move towards it, but we don't want to, right? We've got what we got, we like what we like, and we don't want to go through the process, right? So for those people as well. Um, and for those container curmudgeons that I can kind of highlight here, uh, my hope for you with this, this uh, talk, right? I'm not trying to convince anybody to go a certain way. It's just that, um, again, lesson learned, things that come in my purview and not right really in front of me pass me up and I had to kind of speed learn, try and gather it up really fast. So also trying to find three C words for this was more difficult than I thought. Uh, but I was like, I like the alliteration. So we went with it. Um, Chromogen is actually the last word I found in that. So <laughs> what we will not cover. Um, so for some reason, I decided to pick a very large topic in a very short amount of time, right? That's a great idea. So I, want, I had to start cutting things, right? I had to make some assumptions on the audience and, and who was going to come to this conversation. So a couple things that we won't cover. Um, kind of the step one, day, first day one objective, right? So um, the things like, uh, I'm not going to stand up here and talk about Docker versus Podman. Those are two very prominent container engines. And we'll talk about what those are. But we're not going to talk about the differences between those two. There's a lot of articles out there, a lot of literature out there. So we won't be doing those things. Um, we won't go through a demo of installing Podman or Docker, right? Again, um, my assumption here is that most of the audience is probably that container curious. I've tried a few demos, tried it out, wasn't for me, or didn't see the use in it, right? So we're kind of getting past that to kind of talk about maybe some uses, maybe some next steps. And then we won't be going through a bunch of Podman Docker commands. Now, I wrote this, this line here, and then later on, I'm like, well, I got to do some demos. So we will be doing some things with, with uh, Podman, just because I have it installed on my system, so it works out. OK. And we also, the last one we won't be covering is large container orchestration de deployments, right? Kubernetes, essentially. Right? We're not going that far out. But I mentioned that because Understanding containers, understanding the core parts of that, right? Uh, what you want to orchestrate is kind of the, the base of it. But we're not going to go as far as trying to talk about how to do it in large, uh, in a large capacity across multiple uh, servers or nodes, things like that. So, with that out of the way, what we will, what we do cover, we'll go through some terminology, right? So I said earlier we're not covering day one things, but I at least want to set the baseline of what the words we're going to use, right? How we talk about these things. Maybe there's some terms that you've heard, not really sure what they mean or how they fit into everything, right? Um, talk about the kernel features that make containers happen. So I, I kind of jump back a lot to when containers start to make their prominent, right? They become more prominent. Docker is becoming more popular. Again, this is like 2012, I believe. I forget. Um, but it was really just a black box, right? You do this, you run this, and you can run bash in it for some reason. Okay, well didn't make sense, right? So it didn't really catch my attention. But what does catch my attention is I've been working with Linux for 20 plus years. So understanding how those actually, actually happens, right? The, the features that make that happen, um, the isolation happen, we'll talk about that. Um, that became more interesting. And then one, for lack of a better word, I'm calling container concepts. Um, these are the concepts that I <laughs> embarrassingly just didn't catch on to right away, which is why this kind of the whole thing started, right? Things that maybe I can, highlight and kind of move along. All right, so what are containers, right? We'll start with that. All right, containers are groups of processes running on a Linux system. They're isolated from each other, right? So that's from a uh, Podman in Action free ebook. Um, you can kind of search Podman in Action and kind of download that whole ebook um, from Daniel Walsh. Walsh. And essentially, yeah, it's, it's containers are groups of processes running on a Linux system. And for our purposes here, a Linux system, yes. We can do containers on other things, but right now we're talking about this here. They're isolated from each other. And the big thing about uh, that started to kind of veer me towards understanding a little better was the idea of isolation, the idea that the things are running separate from each other and they don't know about each other, but it's also a better way to manage resources, right? So some ter terminology we're going to go through here. Container image, right? So uh, when we say image, right? So the image is like a template, like a snapshot, right? So if you were familiar with VMs, right? So taking a snapshot of a system, 
the container image is like taking a snapshot of process there. We want to continue to run. And you can use it as a template to create a container, right? An isolated process. So container engine. Uh, so we talk about container engine, right? So the, pro the prominent popular ones are Podman, Docker, right? And so these are for running um, containers on single machines, right? So, um, what is this? And I highlight these two because these are the two that we mostly would interact with if we're trying to learn, if we're trying to start out, right? Um, that's in contrast to container orchestrators or orchestration, right? So software for running containers across multiple machines in, in, different, in multiple networks, right? Kind of expanding out and kind of scaling out. Um, I heard once Kubernetes described as the operating system for a data center. And that kind of clicked for me. Because again, it's all about abstraction, right? So it's all about, if you begin to think that the data center is your, as your uh, uh, OS, right? Or as your hardware, you got your bunch of RAM, bunch of CPU, or a bunch of, yeah, CPU, bunch of RAM, bunch of storage, this large data center. Something like Kubernetes and orchestration can control all of that together, right? And so in the abstraction, the container becomes just the process. And I understood processes at least at some level. So that kind of abstraction began to make more sense thinking about it that way. So, so why containers, right? Um, I kind of, this might be a repeat slide, but um, isolated processes leads to better resource usage and higher density on a single host. So uh, kind of jumping back a little bit, for the longest time, we had these one box wonders, right? So the one box wonder ran your Apache, your MySQL, your PHP, your Plesk probably, a mail server, and any other thing you wanted it to, right? Um, and it was probably always running out of RAM. Had too, too, too little RAM, not enough, right? Um, so this idea of, of density on a server, right? Can we, can, can we better manage those resources uh, in a different way? And so for me, the concept that kind of stuck was like, can I better manage resources through containers, right? Um, turns out you, you can, right? You can put limits around things. You can make sure things don't run away I um, mean, if they do die, well, ideas that they become uh, ephemeral, right? And you kind of bring them back up. So it's kind of where, for me, began to make sense, right? The idea that it's resource utilization, making the, dense, the host more dense, and uh, hopefully not going down all the time, right? Because going down is not good. Uptime is a good thing. So. All right, so looking at what makes containers happen. All right. So we're going to talk about C groups. A little bit. Talk about some namespaces. Talk about container images again. Maybe not. Might be a typo. Um, so the funny thing is that like these things aren't new. C groups and namespaces aren't new. They've been part of the kernel for a while. I think C groups was okay. So I was teaching some Rails six material, and C groups were just coming in. So between five and six. So that's probably. 2010, 2000, before that, 2008, somewhere in there. Um, so the technology that we use to make containers happen isn't new. Namespaces, I think, was 2012 or before that, I forget. Um, and the images themselves are, are like, think about like tarballs, right? If, if, if uh, coming from, a, from an admin who's been doing this for a while, it's like tarball. It's a tarball. It's a, it's a compressed image. So C groups. Boop. Okay. Um, so kind of, again, defining the process here, right? So it's a C groups collection of processes that are bound to set limits of parameters defined by the C group file system. Okay, um, so, so what does that mean kind of in, in, in everyday terms, right? So C groups is how we, uh, I mentioned earlier that containers are about isolation, right? Um, isolate resources such as CPU, RAM, um, networking, and as well as from other processes, right? So the other processes don't know about the other, about anybody, anybody else running. So with C groups, we control the resource utilization, right? So we begin to put, we can, be, we can put limits on things like CPU, RAM, um, and so that it isolates away from the rest of the system. So um, to kind of come over here, not like that. All right, so on any system, again, for, for, for me, the things start to make more sense when I could say, oh, it's using C groups, where are C groups on the system, because 
with Linux, everything is a file, right? So everything has got to be there, right? I always say that Linux is not magic. If it does something, there's a reason, there's a configuration somewhere that makes it do those things. You might not have access to that code or to, uh, well, readily to that code, right? Open source, you have access to it. Uh, but you might not see it right away. You might have to debug things or kind of open up uh, the code, but everything is there for a reason. Everything is there uh, and set, right? It might be doing the things you want to do, but it's doing what it's told to do. Uh, but for this system, you got to tie it in together here. Um, CD, boom, boom, boom. Group. Okay, so this is the file system kind of here that kind of acts as the interface for these C groups, and so you begin to see a lot of these that are uh, what you can begin to control put together. Um, some of these aren't so like if you look at system D, it's just a, a hierarchy. I'll forget to see things like because uh, now for most of uh, system D, it's all put in one general C group. And you can kind of go from there. The hierarchy begins with that. Um, but when you go into any of these, let's go into memory. Memory is an interesting one because memory is kind of for the system as a whole right now, kind of give you things you can control and interact with. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do I want to show on this one? Just okay. All right, so you can begin to manipulate these things here and set limits on processes. Right? We're not going to go too far into it, but I just want to say that here's where it's at. Right? Um, again, big subject, 40 minutes. So um, let's go back here real quick. Uh, namespaces, okay. We're made out of time. Okay. So um, this one from Wikipedia, right? Namespaces are a feature of the Linux kernel that partitions kernel resources, such as uh, so that one process sees one set of resources while another process is a different set of resources. Okay, again, what does that mean? Again, we're back to isolation. So that each process thinks it's the only process in the system, all right? Um, which I'm thinking about the matrix and how would we know if we're in a matrix, how would that process know it's the only process in the system, right? How does it know that there's not other things over there? Yes, there are ways to get out and break and kind of run havoc on the system, but in general, that process thinks it's the only one. Okay, so, um, so to that point, right? So, so let's see not the namespaces, uh, ls and s. These are namespaces in the system. Um, earlier, I was kind of just playing with things and trying to run some demos. Um, so I had this nginx. I'm gonna kill that real quick. So I'm gonna go to Podman real quick. I'm just gonna set things up here for you. Podman, <laughs> And of course, I decided to do a live demo on the fly because, right, why not? Okay. All right, so let me go and start that up. So if we look here, let's, let's, right, so what we saw earlier was namespaces are gone, right? So here are just the standard namespaces for the system. But we've run a container, right? Put the container on the system. Again, just a simple one here, nothing too crazy. Here somewhere. Okay, I'm just shooting out here. Okay, it runs great. Um, what we see now, we do ls and s. Again, we get a tie to the namespace there. All right, so as if you run more containers, more namespaces, uh, again, seeing the isolation from everything else. Um, let's see here, one more time. Okay. Mm. Okay, so container images, right? So, so an image, again, come back to this, it feels like a simple idea or topic, right? But I think when first learning and first kind of starting to train other people, it really is like container versus image, right? And so really, you can't have a container without an image, right? The image is always that kind of base, um, contains all the libraries needed to run applications, kind of the standard definition you hear. So what that means is that it, you, someone took at their application, and bundled it all together with everything they need on the system, the libraries, 
uh, the versions of the, the programming language, so in PHP or Go or Python, everything they need together. They brought it together, and so that runs on the system. Now, the thing about containers, and again, this is again the jump for me because like started to make more sense was that because uh, we have VMs, right? We have VMs, why containers? And the the size, right? The resource utilization. With containers, you're always you're sharing the kernel across all those containers, uh, as opposed to VMs where you have the entire system, entire image each time, right? So it contains all the libraries, and most of the time where it may begin to make sense is you're running an application, whether that may be Nginx, um, a custom application. For me, it was like Nginx and Apache, right? Those two, running those two in a container was kind of what made sense to me. So those, those uh, images are immutable, right? So we don't, we don't change them. So every time that we spin up a new container, copy that image, and then begin to build these layers on top of it. I don't go into layers too much. Um, maybe I should have, but um, <laughs> you have this base image, and then from there you begin to uh, write over it, right? So do, do whatever changes you need to make. Uh, let's see here. So um, talking about engines and, and run times, right? So this was another thing where um, you would hear about Podman, or you would hear about Docker, Container D, um, and you would hear about Run C, um, Kata containers, right? So all these ideas of, of what, were the, what was the difference between all of them, right? So a lot of, a lot of terms, a lot of things thrown out there. So kind of break it down a little bit. So, all right. Um, the most popular ones, most prominent ones are container engines, right? So the engines, what we hear most often, Docker and Podman, right? Popular container engines. So what does that mean to be a container engine? Well, mostly it's the interface with the end users, right? So us as end users run a command, interface with the, the API for Docker or Podman to run commands, right? So uh, it's what we kind of have that CLI with. Um, interface with image registries. So another jump, to, for at least for me, was I understood packaging. I understood yum and apt. I understood how it's like, hey, there's these softwares packaged. I pull it down in my system. Great. So again, associating that with image registry. So these are just image registry. So the images are kind of like packages, right? So they're just pre-compiled, put together uh, software. And these are the jumps that started to make where I was like, oh, okay, it's not that kind of mystery box, right? More and more kind of starting to cover how they all ties together. And then, so the interface with the container runtime. So the container engine interfaces with the container runtime. So to that point, what is whoops, container runtime? So, um, so run C, C run. Um, so they manage the container lifecycle. So if we interact with, let's say, Podman to run a container, what the runtime is doing is actually setting up the C groups, setting up uh, the namespaces, all of the things that make the, within the Linux system that make it happen, that's the one doing it. That's the runtime doing it. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, real quick, um, I kind of step back here. There's a uh, to the engine part, right? I mentioned container D. I didn't say anything about it again. Um, and the reason I didn't do that is container, container D is more for uh, Kubernetes and you, as an end user, you don't interface with that as much as you would like Podman or Docker. That's why I mentioned it, but didn't come back to it, right? So there are some engines that are meant for, again, larger scale deployments, larger scale implementations, things like that, um, that are, are less, I guess, end user friendly, if you will, right? So I'm mentioning these two because those are the two that are most end user friendly. Okay, yeah, step so C groups and namespaces. And then um, works to can I just set up the uh, network and storage and things like that. Okay. So to that point. Sorry, run and manage container. Okay. So container volumes. Um, okay. So this is where we get, where we get to the point of con con concepts or things that, again, embarrassingly, I just didn't think about or put together until later on. But again, most of the tutorials were, were, were run bash in this container. It's useful, it's kind of useful to me, 
um, or it was run Apache and then nothing after that, right? So I got Apache, it's 80. It's the uh, default page, again. So these are the things that start to kind of build upon where like, okay, I, get, I begin to get it, right? So lessons learned. So persistent data and ephemeral processes. So does anybody remember when there was a, the analogy of Cal versus pets? It was probably, again, when, when Docker was coming out, right? There was this idea that like, you treat these servers that you, do, you don't want to reboot, or you don't want to rebuild as pets, right? And then these uh, containers, the idea was containers where they were as cattle. You could process them, you, one died, you bring another one up. It's a terrible analogy. It was a really, really bad analogy. I don't know why they just didn't say ephemeral processes, right? Maybe ephemeral was a bad word, or like a bigger word. Um, but the idea that the processes don't stay around all the time. Again, translating it to processes on any system, a process isn't meant to live forever, right? It should go, if, it's if it fails, you should be able to restart it. Simple as that. So persistent data, ephemeral processes. So this whole idea that containers were uh, ephemeral, they could go away. Um, I was like, well, how would you write a thing with it? The database makes no sense. Um, website, for where does it store data? All these kind of questions that I didn't know. Um, so let's talk about persistent storage on uh, these container engines. And the thing is, most of the time, the engine handles a lot of the, um, the storage side of it, right? So there's two ways to do this, right? So the first one is bind mounts, okay? Now bind mount is, oh, sorry, bind mounts, volumes. Okay, bind mounts, here we go. <laughs> so a bind mount allows one part of the file system to be mounted in another place in the file system. Now this I understood, right? Again, working with systems, working with Chirrut jails, things like that. So a Chirrut jail would be um, um, essentially trapping a user, like they say, an SFTP user or FTP user into one directory where that's all they see, right? It looks like root to them. Kind of similar in the idea. So that, those things made sense, right? So a bind mount. Um, so for example, I would bound, uh, mount bind var log hbd into home admin logs. So I make this point here because I um, had, had a customer one time who says, I, I need this one person to see the Apache logs, but nothing else. That's it, just the logs, nothing else. And so this is what we came up with at the time. And the thing about bind mounts is that it's just a mapping from the host and at least the container from one directory to another. So if you delete files in one directory, you delete them in the other. Um, and so it's kind of just a mapping. I had uh, set up this whole system where they could have all the logs they needed, thinking I was great, clean. So I was like, I'm gonna clean it up and let them set up what they need. So in the home directory of home admin logs, of course, I do an rm-rf, think I'm in home admin forgetting that I did a, um, uh, a bind mount and deleted everything, right? I, I, was on, I was on the phone with backup so fast because I was like, oh, that's what that means. So uh, let's see here. So bind mounts and containers. So it's a way to provide persistent storage to a container, um, kind of decoupling the file system or file system storage from the container itself. Again, the container dies, you still have the storage, you still have the data that generated or the data you want to provide to it. So some examples of where you would have a, a bind mount would be, um, provides files for a web server, right? So classic example that kind of started to build my understanding was I have an Apache server, I'm going to bind mount a directory of content to the document root for Apache, right? So it begins, okay, that's, now I see where that comes from, okay? Um, from that point there, you begin to see if, oh, if I have one, I can use it multiple times, remount the same uh, path to multiple uh, web servers as long as I'm not writing to it, right? So, uh, kind of just, uh, just read only, if you will. Um, you can also use it to share additional update config files. So let's say you need to, say you're a developer and you need to test out uh, new settings for your application, for your code. Um, having a bind mount lets you modify on your host system and be present on your container right away. Kind of sharing files across, okay. All right, test good, yeah, okay. So container volumes, right? So bind mounts were easy to use, um, but both Docker and Podman say, hey, they're not the best to use, right? They want you to use the built-in system for them for your volumes. And both uh, Podman and Docker have uh, that concept of volumes, and a lot of engines do as well, so. Can be used amongst containers, so you can mount them up against different containers. Container dies, bring it up on a different one, all right? Um, and more manageable within the engine itself, the environment itself. 
uh, stores a file container storage, right? So while we had the bind mount as the host system mounted into the container, which number one, introduces a lot of security issues, a lot of problems. If you happen to run that container as root and you have it bound, mounted in, anybody in that container is also root. Um, so container volumes allows you to kind of manage it a different, a different way, right? So it's kind of separate again from the host system and lets you have persistent storage that's not associated with the host system directly. <laughs> okay. um, container communication. So again, the next kind of concept that I sort of thought um, was the isolated, how they communicate, right? These things, are, if these things are isolated from each other, they don't know about each other, how do, how do I make it kind of work together, right? And this is the part that we talk about um, like microservices, right? You have a bunch of containers, they're all isolated, they don't know about each other, but then they, how they communicate, right? So this kind of next big step. Um, so there's a couple ways it can happen. Uh, so app to host container, right? So app or host to container. So uh, when I say app or host, that might be your application, let's say, uh, we have your custom app running on the host machine, but you need to talk to information inside a container or vice versa, right? Uh, the other one, container to container, okay? <laughs> so, um, again, I mentioned earlier that I'm not going to do a whole bunch of pod manager Docker commands, but this one kind of just to show you where things are, right? So, app or host um, to the container. So, the easy way is that a lot of containers have exposed ports. Classic example would be Apache exposing port 80 uh, to the system, or to the, to the, from the container out. So this happens through a mapping, right? So let me see here. I'm on this one. Okay, okay cool. So I'll do this here. Is it you here? You're not. Hold on. Okay, well, let's do this then. Okay, there we go. Okay, let me put that here. All right. Um, another step that really jumped at me was how do I begin to look at this, these images, these, uh, the storage, the, all the, how do I look at these things? Um, and so, just real quick here, a Podman image inspect and then the container we have, right? So, um, showing this to kind of give you an idea of what's in there. But what we're looking for in this case here, when we talk about exposed ports or how do we talk to this container through our system, is going to be under here, exposed ports. So, AD. TCP, okay? So this tells me that this image is exposing port 80. So I can map something from my host system, from my like, main system to this container on port 80. And so what that might look like is, mm, aha, I do have this. <laughs> what that might look like is this here, is that I have this container running. It's using that image. Again, that image is mutable. It's always the same image, kind of base image there. Um, the command that's running, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then the mapping, right? So this tells me that on my host machine, port 42289 is mapped to 80 on that web server. Now, if I plan to do more demos, which I didn't, we could probably do something like curl. Um, and get, it works, right? Um, so, but that's talking to the container, uh, process, or the container, the process running on the container. Okay, um, let's see, we're on time. Okay, is it 40 or 45? What's lunch next? We got good lunch. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So we'll work through this, and then if there's questions, we'll do questions and kind of make sure we're on time here. All right. So container to container. Um, so if you want one container to talk to another container, and 
we're talking just with um, kind of within that Podman Docker realm because there's other ways to do it uh, with pods and things like that. They're a bigger concept. Um, there's networking, right? So the engines implement a, a bridge interface, right? So if you look at on my machine here, note that one. Right there. So there is a, an interface that all of the containers get added to, right? We can add, can add networks, remove networks, kind of begin to manage that. Um, so again, using this inspect command, kind of show you what it looks like. Oh, poor man. Inspect, or hold on. Right? Yes, okay. So um, you can create the, you create your own networks, kind of these virtual uh, software-defined networking, right? That's the end. Um, that we can create this network on the system, tells me my IP address and my gateway and things like that. Um, and so, well, I'll show that. Okay. So I have this running in a, I was setting up Ghost, right? It's a blogging software. Um, so I created, where is it? Yeah, Ghost Network. Um, and I can see here, if I look at the, the pods I have running, I think this one has it. Right, okay, yeah, so looking at that, we look at networks. Yeah, and so we see here that again, the add machines to a certain network, and they can all talk together, right? So now I can reference each other through IP addresses, one machine versus the other. And so where that took me in kind of my learning journey uh, is to, I was like, well, that makes sense. Like, this kind of makes sense. I can see I have, a, I have a container, it runs a web service. I have another container, has another web service. Okay, it makes sense to me, these processes. And then I was like, okay, well, I want to balance between them. So we looked at, So in my early on brain, I was like, okay, I'll just run. So let me hide this command real quick. I think I don't like having commands on the screen without explaining them. So let's do that real quick. There we go. Okay. So this is the most we're going to do with commands. Um, just kind of the idea of how it all kind of start to come together. So podman run dash d uh, for detach. So I don't want to see it. It's going to put it in the background. Again, a lot with... Again, these things start to make sense. We're like, oh, it runs in the background. I get this. These begin to um, gel together, if you will. Uh, RM just means that after this thing dies, we're going to remove it. So it's not going to hang around. Uh, give it a name, ghost app one. Uh, network. So we're adding it to a network, the ghost network, where I can add other machines and put it all together. I'm giving an IP address. I can, I can assign IP addresses out. Um, and so I know that this one has a certain IP address. Uh, and then I am, so here, this v dash v for, for volume. I'm doing a bind mount for a users, me, ghost content to volume ghost. So that, that first part of that before the semicolon or the before the colon is a path on my system. After that is a path in the container, right? Um, and you would know this through either documentation or through write, knowing the app intimately, right? So this was a Apache web server. I know that var www.html would be where I put content traditionally, or usually. Uh, and then calling the, calling the uh, container ghost. So thinking, okay, I have one container, I have two containers. I need Nginx in front of that to load balance them, right? So then I started like, okay, this makes sense. Um, but then I jumped into, well, it, it's kind of, it was kind of a pithy moment, a pithy moment where I was like, I got these things, but it should be easier than this. And I was like, oh, I get it now. That's why we have orchestration. Because I was trying to run this up, do system setups. Um, but in the end, one thing I do want to bring up as well is, ah, okay, orchestration, real quick here, but not really, right? So um, that's, this is just a, what I showed you earlier. Um, so one thing that I'm trying, I'm playing with more now, like my next step of kind of, again, digging in, learning more, um, is Podman works really well with systemd in that it can run and bring up 
containers as services, in the same way as services, as a, the same way as services. So reboot, um, so this comes up, I don't have to worry about having to start up a daemon or have to um, hop on there and start up manually. That kind of generates systemd files for you, which I find quite nice. So I don't have too much to say about this other than that it's out there and that uh, it's kind of what I'm looking at next for kind of just next steps in learning. So um, kind of in my own systems, right? Not, not necessarily with the day-to-day -day jobs, but in my own systems testing, uh, be able to have this come up as I build servers and take them down, things like that. So, all right. 45, look at that. All right, review and wrap up. So um, we covered a lot of things here, right? So C groups, namespaces, and images. These are the things that on the underlying system make containers work for the most part. Again, none of it's new, which made me feel better about it. I feel like I was, it's just like I, I understand these things because they're on the system. It wasn't this, again, this black box. Um, container engines and runtimes, we talked about the differences between engines and runtimes, how they interact. Um, again, popular engines would be Podman, Docker, runtimes, um, run C, and Kata containers. Um, I didn't mention too much about Kata containers. Um, it's something I'm still kind of exploring myself. Uh, but essentially, it's a different, different runtime for, for containers. And if I believe it correctly, m even more through like hardware isolation as well. If I could be wrong on that. If I'm wrong, someone correct me. Um, and container volumes, right? Again, these concepts that help me jump to the next step of just getting past running that first day one tutorials. Volumes and networking, and then orchestration. Um, again, uh, how to start moving towards multiple containers in the same network that can talk to each other, and it's really begin to see that, that uh, build up for microservices as well. Right? So, um, okay, so closing Q&A. It's my cat. I have three, but this is the best one. So don't tell the other ones. And so Q&A, also whiskey recommendations. I love whiskey. If you want to talk whiskey, you can do that too. So that's all I got. Thank you all very much. First of all, thank you, Alex. Yeah. I don't know if anyone has uh, questions. I got the mic back here, so just raise your hand. Do any of these uh, tools uh, apply better to embedded systems, smaller versus larger servers? Yeah, I love the question. So the um, question was, do any of these tools apply better to embedded systems, right? So um, of what we talked about, uh, one of the major differences between um, Docker and Podman is that Podman is agentless, right? So there's less overhead to run. So on embedded systems, on edge systems as well, you, uh, anything where there's less resources, those seems to run a little better. Um, if I was looking at embedded systems, I might look at LXC or LXD. It's even less overhead as well. L -L LXC? Yeah. LXC. <laughs> Way bigger. Um, but for embedded systems, for edge systems, that's what I look for. Because again, you just want to go less resources, less overhead um, in those things. So. So between the two, Docker and Podman, I would look at Podman, um, just because it's daemonless, or agentless, but daemonless. All right, any more questions? Okay, I'm bad. Uh, so a lot of the examples of everything are, are uh, predicated on the assumption that what you're trying to run in these containers are, you know, system services, you know, web browser, or sorry, web servers, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, in my environment, the, the main use case we've found for containers is actually uh, uh, end user applications. Mm -hmm. um, you got, we got some uh, scientists that needs to run an experiment or something and they're not running a service, they just, they want to go somewhere, run their thing and yeah. use it and whatever, and then they're done. Mm -hmm. um, or some some of these tools seem like they're not well, like Docker. Are seem like they're not well designed for that type of use case. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have uh, suggestions or uh, what's a better way of, of, of addressing those types of needs? So. Yeah. Um, hmm. So running kind of like one time processes or like yeah, just one time processes. Yeah. 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 Um, so what comes to mind because more what I do with day to day is looking at um, what's we're looking for. Um, serverless, right? So you have, like, it's like Kubernetes, right? This whole orchestration system. Um, 
And how do I put this? I think those are more apt to that kind of like multi-user um, running containers and then just do what they do and come back, right? And not to worry, not to worry about them, right? Um, the thing with serverless is that it, when there's nothing to run, it doesn't run anything. There's no resources used. When it's ready, there's a small, there's a small spin up time, but it's meant for kind of that ephemeral thing, which is run process, get the data, die off. Run the process, get the data, die off. So it's not meant for things that are continually running, right, like services. So I look something like that. And in that case, I mean, I would look at cloud providers that offer that, right? So like, I think like Lambda. Right, um, something like that to kind of make it easier to launch those things. But from Podman or Docker, I, I kind of agree with you. They're not really meant for that. They're meant for single node or single host, right? And so one machine. If you want to run it against, I guess I'm, I'm assuming you want to run it against a larger network, right? Multiple machines have resources all over, but, or maybe it's just one machine. Yeah, here, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's a good question. A good support. I'll if you come up here and get your information. I'll look into it. <laughs> Any more questions? All right. <clears throat> when you say the the containers use less resources, why is that the case? Because it seems like there are like process memory spaces and and things that the system will often. Uh, you know, allocate far more for, and then, and then, you know, it'll overcommit, and then, and then, you know, give the give that extra space to other processes. It it seems like the normal the normal Linux system is pretty good at at keeping those resources low. So how does the container make it less resource intensive? Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, it, it's it's comparison, right? So less resource intensive than say a VM. We'll start with that, right? Since so, so the VM. Um, with a VM, you have a lot more, like you have another kernel, you have all the other files that you don't need for that one process, right? So there's a larger image. So there's, there's that in there. Um, and even with VMs, you can put parameters around it, right? Um, that hopefully you manage it properly and you don't go, go you don't overcommit, right? But we all know overcommit's gonna happen, right? Um, with the containers, um, they don't have the extra kernel, extra space. It's just so it's a smaller image, right? So we use less in that. Um, when it comes to CPU, you can go down to, is it, I forget the exact uh, measurement, right? I think it's like, if you have, it's like up to the one one thousandth of a CPU. So you can allocate even parts of a CPU to it um, to get dedicated to, or a whole, or whole CPU. It's like a CPU set and dedicate to it, right? So it separates away from the rest of the system. Um, so let that kind of run its own. Uh, process, our own kind of like area. Um, at some point it becomes what, you, like, what I would call a developer's answer to a server problem, right? Running off resources. Just, I went this time where um, we saw PHP INI files, like just taking gigabytes of data for, for PHP process, right? I call that a, a developer's answer to a server problem. Like, why don't you look at the code, right? Look at the, optimize that way. Um, but to kind of get back to your question, the, the resource relation is comparison to run like a VM. That's like what I, mean, what I meant by that, I guess, per se. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah. Uh, any more questions? That's a tangent. Sorry about that. <laughs> no. All right. Thank you, Alex. Cool. Thank you. Bam.